starting with today's presentation. Uh, tonight's talk uh, with David will be a chance to reflect on the artistic and cultural heritage of New Hampshire's 350 year tradition of fine furniture making. Um, and I think that uh, we will be uh, very pleased to see the unveiling of the object, which we'll be doing virtually since we can't share it with you uh, in the galleries. And this piece has been inspired by David's experiences and by uh, New Hampshire's natural and cultural environment. And David will talk more about that during his presentation. Um, the brief bio for people, uh, David's been making furniture since 1972 when he began an apprenticeship with the European trained master cabinet maker Alejandro Dela Cruz, and that was in Canterbury, the town where David grew up. He attended Boston University's program in artisanry where he studied with another New Hampshire furniture master, Jerry Osgood who's represented in the Courier's collection. And in 1980, David opened his own studio in Canterbury. He's a founding member of the New Hampshire Furniture Masters Association, which this year celebrates its 25th anniversary. I've been a very important group in the arts in New Hampshire uh, for the last 25 years. David also served as New Hampshire Artist Laureate uh, from 2010 to 2014. And his work is represented in the Courier collection by a demi moon table from 2000 uh, with beautiful stonework by his collaborator Chance Anderson, another Canterbury artist. And in 2012, uh, David and his frequent collaborator a new, and fellow New Hampshire artist laureate James Aponovich exhibited their monumental White Mountain Breakfront at the Courier for um, several months, and that was a fabulous presentation. Uh, David has won numerous design awards and his work has been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, a New Hampshire Home Magazine, and a featured topic in television programs like New Hampshire Outlook and New Hampshire Chronicle, and now even on Zoom. So uh, I'd like to welcome David, and since we can't share the piece with you in person, what we've done is we've put together a short video, it's just about three minutes, it gives you a brief tour of the piece. And after we have a chance to view that, uh, David will tell us about some of the challenges and uh, wonderful discoveries of making the piece. So why don't we show the video and then we'll talk a bit. Carol? My name is David Lamb. Uh, I live in Canterbury, New Hampshire, and I'm a furniture maker there, and I have been uh, in my professional shop since 1980. I'm here talking about my latest creation, the New Hampshire Secretary, the classically inspired piece. So it's a, a traditional piece with new ideas. To the person that came upon it, I wanted the overall form to be familiar. And of course, we go back to neoclassical seacoast work, like what was done in Portsmouth or Boston or the North Shore, uh, to capture that general sense. And I wanted a bow front that would really be dynamic. And then the birch, of course, was a primary detail uh, material that was heavily used in Portsmouth and the North Shore. And I just like to revive that use of it because I think it's spectacular. It's our, it's our native jewel that gets not appreciated as much as it should. When I was a teenager at Shaker Village, living in those old houses with the single pane glass windows, I remember the incredible frost patterns that would develop on the glass in the winter. I wonder if I could translate birch wood something opaque to look almost translucent like ice so i started scratching my head and experimenting and and i think this piece that we're talking about now is the culmination of that process i am very impressed um, with the work of grinling gibbons the 17th century 
English court carver that would carve for royalty, Windsor uh, Castle and, and all the various manor homes. He would layer parts to create that effect of depth and also to be able to carve thoroughly the front and the back. You couldn't have all sorts of other material there in the way because you couldn't get your tools in there. So I took that lead and with the maple leaves specifically, that carving is actually an assemblage of three separate carvings. So I wanted, because I'm a traditionalist at heart, I wanted to build the piece in the very best traditional manner. So I was very pleased with the way that came out. Thank you, Carol. Um, why don't we start the PowerPoint now? Um, so we have some images we'd like to share and would like uh, David to walk us through the process of uh, the inspiration for the piece and also some of the construction. And I think my first question to, to David would be that uh, you call the piece the New Hampshire Secretary and it's inspired by, uh, as I mentioned, your experiences and sort of themes of New Hampshire. So could you talk to us a little bit about, about that and where the inspiration for the piece came? Sure. Uh, my, you know, ever since I was a kid, I did a lot of, uh, spent a lot of time in the woods fishing and hiking and so forth. So I really became very close to the, to the forest, and especially the mountains. Uh, of the the state, and so that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, the sugar, you know, the sugar maple tree, the birch trees, and then the other part of it is my training. Uh, being such a traditionalist, um, having a great affinity for the work that was done in Portsmouth area, the especially the neoclassical period. Um, I just find that the designs are very. Uh, they're somewhat restrained, they're very sophisticated, and they really show off the use of, of our native, our, our state tree, the birch tree. And whether it's the, the desk we see on the left, uh, all those panels, beautifully flame figured, or the, the back of the chair with that wonderful flame figure, it's, it's just spectacular. And I really wanted to follow that same tradition and uh, ex expand upon it and do a really stunning, uh, remarkable piece that really shows off that material. And then of course the, the, the mountains and the forests of the north, um, we're gonna look at a couple of paintings here that really um, capture that sense of drama. And especially when you think of the winter the, the season here with our um, world br record breaking wind speeds and cold temperatures and, and the ice and the snow um, is, is really a part of, of this place. So the, the design of the piece was to reflect not only man's creative ability in a formal way, but also the, the geography and, and the sense of place that we have here in the state. So David, one of the things we talked about when we uh, first embarked on the commission was giving you an opportunity to do something really dramatic, uh, you know, to stretch, do something unusual, something you'd wanted to do. And one of the key features of this piece is that uh, flame birch veneer with the frost inspired pattern. Yes. Um, so why don't you t tell us about how much of a challenge that was and how you approached that uh, as both a, an idea and a composition and also as a, as a technique? Well, it's a very time consuming process to start. And I think you could start by saying that because the, this material is not commercially available. Um, so in the event of trying to gather the material, I literally have to go out into the woods. Um, but let me backtrack a little bit just to say that you know, on a, on a daily basis in the winter as I'm walking the dog or strolling around the shaker ponds, I'm always looking at nature and, and things and, and looking at the ice and how it forms on ponds and puddles. And again, the, the window frost and 
I became just fascinated by that growth pattern of these ice crystals. And it's a fractal. That, that's the way we can express it. It's a fractal patterning of interweaving, intersecting ice crystals. And I just thought, man, wouldn't it be great to translate that? And I thought birch was the obvious uh, answer to that because of its very pale nature. And I thought I could just take that um, very light wood and do this. So it was a lot of experimenting. Uh, but then to get the material, because it's not commercially available, I had to go out in the woods and I was able to um, locate about nine trees for this project, each tree having four or five crotches. So I had, you know, a, a whole number of these, uh, 40 to 45 of these crotches that I, I cut to length and then processed. Uh, the next slide will show my dry kiln that I had to make. So once I processed these crotches into smaller billets, I just removed most of the material that was not part of what I was looking for. I could stack them up, dry them with a, with a combination of fan and dehumidifier. This was all enclosed. It was insulated and the dehumidifier has a heat source. So within a matter of oh, was about a month or so, I was able to go from green wood to fully dried down to about 7% moisture content, which is the moisture content for traditional cabinet woods. So it was very critical to have a very stable material. Once it was dry, then I could go to my 125 year old Dover, New Hampshire made bandsaw and slice. And as you can see, I'm taking very thin slices. The veneer is thin and that's what makes it controllable. So I'm making a 16th of an inch slices, give or take, it's a little heavier than that. And the next slide will show the stacks of, of veneer. So you can imagine if I have say 50 crotches and each one is cut in half, that's a hundred pieces and I'm getting multiple slices from each one, I get quite a, quite a supply. So I keep them all organized per piece. And so this gives me my, my palette, I guess. Each, each chunk is slightly different in color slightly different in uh, texture and figure intensity. And so this is what I get to play with to create my, my composition. So this is a great photograph because it shows the overall design of, of one panel. I can't recall if this is a door or if this is one of the side panels, but I had 10 panels to create. And each one was different. And each one was uh, orchestrated to mimic that uh, fractal patterning that ice has. And as you can see, um, I have pieces of wood on a larger pattern. Each of these pieces has its own pattern. So I made copies of the larger pattern cut them up, assigned them to specific pieces of wood, and started that long process of joining one to another until I finally had an assemblage of the whole panel. Yeah. And uh, once that whole assemblage was done, it was like a sheet, and it was at that point that I could glue it down to the substrate, whether it's uh, just a flat panel for a side or the door, and the next slide will show um, that door after the glue is cured, I pull it out and it's at that point when I can scrape all the paper patterning off, when I discover the success of, of the match of the woods and you know how tight the, the joints are and, and how does this door match to the next. So it's a, it's a real sort of heart in your throat kind of moment when you're, you, you have a pretty good feeling of what you're wanting to accomplish. You don't know till you've gone through all those processes. So I'm typically putting weeks and weeks of work into building the substrate, um, the laminating of the doors and the, and the patterns for all that, 
and it's not until you're scraping that paper off that you find out whether it worked. So luckily, everything worked out perfectly, um, and I didn't have to backtrack, but I was, you know, a little on edge until I knew for sure. This is a great uh, little end view of one of the doors, and you can see the, the reflection of the bow front chest, the curve of the door. And we're just about at the point of applying the lower bead, what's called a cock bead at the very bottom edge. And I'm using masking tape as a clamping method for gluing that down. But you can see all the layers of the veneer. It's a cross, cross laminated process to make a stable uh, surface. Okay. So David, the, the result is just really spectacular. And one of the things we talked about a little bit during some of those studio visits uh, that I made was that there, the, the two doors, the opposing panels are not mirror images. There's really a sense of composition in there. They are, in, in a way, they, are, they sort of reflect each other, but they're not intended to be exact um, replication. So it really gives the whole service a very dynamic sense of movement, um, this sort of shattered ice or, or fractal pattern which I think uh, on the front and on both sides really makes the piece very animated and, and you get a real scintillating surface and appearance. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I, I tried very hard because this is supposed to be a naturalistic presentation of the way things grow in nature, that it would be uh, illogical to make them mirror images of each other. So, however, I also wanted them to balance. And so they, sort of have the same format in the way the, the patterning starts in the corners and comes out or starts in the middle of the side and comes out, but they're clearly different. Uh, in fact, every pattern or every panel, whether it's the sides or the doors, they're all different. And that meant each piece is different. And there are about a thousand pieces of wood that are assembled to make these. Every single one is different. And that's kind of a lot to think about when you're anticipating making one of these, but it was a tremendous amount of fun. Well, the, the whole moment of revelation and serendipity, I think is, you know, is really engaging. Um, we talked a lot about the construction of the piece on the, on the studio visits. And I think what may surprise a lot of people is that um, a lot of the wood has been re-engineered. It's not solid wood as it would come out and be milled from the tree. And also, as you pointed out during construction, there were a number of challenges in how the joinery was planned to accommodate the veneer panels um, and also the bow front and the, the bowed cornice. Uh, so it would be interesting to hear a little bit about you know, how you thought through some of those challenges in the joinery and also in the production of the panels that were used uh, to form the really stable um, un underpinning of the veneer panel. Sure. Um, yes, it was very critical to have material that was stable, that was not going to expand and shrink uh, during the years changing humidity levels um, because you have all these pieces of veneer being laid on it all at different angles. And if that material underneath is moving throughout the year, um, and that's a natural occurrence, if that's happening, then you're the joints and all those veneers are going to show after a point. So I wanted something very stable to have the best presentation possible. At the same time, I wanted a very traditional approach. The technique for um, making things like this is hundreds of years old and I wanted as a craftsman to follow that same tradition. So the answer was making this re-engineered material that's called lumber core. And it's basically, um, you're orienting the wood in a certain way and you're building up each panel with a whole number of separate strips that are glued together and then face veneering them in a couple of layers. And this process of building it up like that makes for a very stable, uh, non-shrinkable material. At the same time, it gives me material that I can also cut these dovetails like you see. And then throughout the rest of the piece, I've got mortise and tenon joints. Um, and you can also see that the front edges of these panels are, are uh, 
have a layer of birch uh, on them because I'm then going to mill uh, these the specific edge to it. It's a the chamfer that runs up the corners. Uh, the next slide will show that dynamic bow front, which I think is is fantastic. And if you look at the center of the left hand picture, and also the pretty much the center of the right hand picture here, you can see that chamfer detail. The chamfer is the bevel um, that runs from the tip of the toe right up the side. It transitions through each molding and then finishes to nothing up in the cornice. And the purpose of this was a, a strong design feature that I had from the beginning and that I wanted to carry out that theme of like a block of ice, like a crystal. And I didn't want just um, flat sides and a flat back. I wanted these corners running up through it to kind of enhance that idea of a crystal. Um, but this was very tricky to do because the next slide will kind of show that these joints uh, were sort of unconventional where the, and this is the molding at the waist where I had a, a traditional mortise and tenon. I also had these really oddball angles that, that had to carry out the, the extremes of the transfer, uh, of the transition of this chamber from one dimension to another through a curve. Is, there's an awful lot of thinking and head scratch that we're doing to create this. The net, uh, David, if you look, if you look carefully, right, just to the left of the letter R in the middle of the screen, right, that's the chamfer, the the the, the sort of forty-five bias running up and down, and right then there. yeah, and then normally this joint would just be a like a, a 45 or it would be like a, a butt joint. So this is like a compound miter joint. Is that, how would you describe? Yeah, it's like a compound miter joint. And then it's also, after it's glued together, it's then shaped to create the illusion of a secondary miter coming in. Um, so the, the illusion is, or, or the goal is not to say, oh, look at that joint, but to say, oh, look at that shaping. And so you come across and you have that, that shape going in there and you're seeing the, the point of the change. And ideally everything is so tight, you can't, you know, you can't see that joint. Um, and I think that was accomplished. Um, perhaps the previous slide um, shows that. Yeah, so it shows up in the corner there where the top cabinet um, comes to the bottom cabinet and you can see that the transition point there. So it's, it was very, very tricky and difficult. So I had that to do there and down the bottom and then also up at the crown. Yeah, I think there's a, is there a shot of that on the, if you go forward two slides, Carol, that shows, you can see again in the middle of the slide where that chamfer is coming down to the bottom. In this case, we're actually looking at the underside of the bottom case, but you can see the chamfer at the very bottom of the screen and how it is transitioning to the foot. Um, but while we're looking at it, we can talk about the foot right now and maybe there's another picture of that. Yeah, I think there's a picture of the foot next. Yeah, so this is showing the tenoning going in. So typically with a traditional piece, you're, you're making the foot, you stick it down, you glue it, and you put a couple of glue blocks. This has a very thorough joining method in mortise and tenon and face blowing as well as blocking. So it's a very, uh, this is something I've been developing over the years and it's a very uh, substantial joint. And, and even though the leg has a delicate appearance, it's, it's very rugged. And then the next slide, I just I just like to include this to remind to remind me both of my studio visits, but also just the fact that all of these panels were veneered before the cabinet was assembled because you needed to be able to press them flat uh, to have the veneering work. And it, this is one of the first times you had a chance to see what the scale and the form of the piece was going to be with the with the veneer applied to the surfaces. 
I'm glad you brought that up because yes, you have to do all that surface preparation before you can even cut the joint. So there's a lot riding on that, on the whole process throughout. Um, just a thoroughly exhaustive process in a way, but exhilarating at the same time. And then I think we have a we have a shot of the interior, um, which both gives you a sense of the plan of the interior, but also the slide on the left shows again how some of that detailed joinery transmits through the through the piece. Right, we're trying to get at sort of a theatrical feeling to this, almost like you're looking at a stage, and it's a it's a nice kind of interior for displaying of objects of art or special items. So one of the, um, the, the most dramatic elements of the, of the piece, uh, not that it isn't all very complicated, was the, the design and the execution of this uh, cornice element, which is something I know you experimented uh, in other works like the White Mountain Breakfront. But here we have the combination of the carved frieze panel. We have a, a cove with some arched veneer, um, and that all supports this larger um, carved element. Uh, so I think if we could talk a little bit about the frieze and how that how that came about and what the themes are there. Sure, well the theme with the frieze is is the northern forest and specifically the sugar maple tree. And I love the sugar maple leaf here because it with this kind of an arrangement it's again it's a it's a, a asymmetrical uh, presentation and a very naturalistic form and it has the opportunity for all sorts of shadows, which helps with depth and a sense of um, contrast with the rest of the piece. And um, again, you can see the, the chamfer running up the, the corner of the piece and how it uh, turns to, to nothing right through that, that molding on, above the, the leaf. Um, but, the, but what you can see quite prominently is the curved aspect to that freeze that carved freeze work and that that was a steam bent process to acquire that which was again sort of a labor of love because it was such a job um, but that was the only way to do it properly and to create this effect and then of and the other aspect of the maple leaf that i like is the pointed nature of of the uh lobes of the leaf i think a reflective uh, of the fractal nature of the veneer work below it. And then contrasting with that, this repeated arch design, which I've been doing over the years, as you mentioned, uh, is a great repetitive kind of pattern. And this is a more organized uh, pattern um, that kind of pulls us back into the traditions of, of earlier furniture making. Not that they did this particular pattern, but the repetitive nature of it. And our next there's, a, there's a good t detail of that a couple slides ahead. Um, so there's the there's the cornice with the bowed uh, carved panel um, mm -hmm. and the maple leaves on uh, the the front and the two sides. And then I think here the next slide, David, is your the um, that arch veneer work you were talking about in that uh, curved uh, molding above the leaves. Right, and this is. Again, you see the, the chamfer running up in the corner on the left there, and these, uh, these small arches, which are actually about two inches tall, um, these are, are very critical to do and do properly. And I've got one person that helps me with that, and that's my wife, Janet. And she is exceptionally skilled at this. She is the perfect person to do it. Here you can see her cutting out parts, and each one is done one at a time um, and it's fitted from left to right as you can see the chunk of uh, molding in front of her with and you can't really see the wood because it's covered with masking tape but that's how it's built out the next slide gives you a better idea of of the pieces as they go so you have the shield shape and then sort of a v shape and it it goes right across and each one of these pieces is specifically laid out and you can see uh, there are registration room uh, marks on the board so it has to fall exactly into place because when you cut the joints 
at the corner of this cornice, those the layout of this is so critical because if it's off by an eighth of an inch and you make that cut, then it's going to look like you made an error. So she did it absolutely perfectly. Um, I'm really thrilled about that. And, and also the, the gluing of this, this is a concave shape. So it, it's done in the vacuum bag a section at a time. So I think the next slide shows it. There we go. This shows the, the, the built out uh, crown unit. And I want to say here, the reason I'm showing it like this in the shop, my ceilings are over eight feet tall, but this piece exceeds that height. And while I was building it, I was never able to uh, fully display it completed in my shop. It wasn't until I delivered it to your museum, Andrew, where I could see it finally all together all at once. Yeah, that was very interesting. I'd go by sometimes and I'd see the bottom parts of it stacked up and then the next visit I'd see the top part stacked up but never the whole thing assembled um, in one in one place until we had it delivered. Right. Um, so I'd, I'd like to um, talk more about the carving here because you mentioned that in the video and that was a really important aspect for us with the commission is um, having an opportunity to let you explore uh, this really uh, lifelike three-dimensional carving and uh, your uh, inspiration by English cabinet making um, from the Baroque period. Uh, so why don't we, um, I think we have a number of details here that sort of shows how these uh, three elements at the corners and then the center uh, came together. Sure. Sure, this, um, I wanted a very naturalistic approach. Uh, this is a great pair of photographs here because I wanted birch leaves looking like they kind of fell out of the tree and just sort of landed on the corner of, of this cabinet and just very naturally and casually drape over the molding. And I want it to be very airy. And so each one of these, so there's a left and a right and they're similar. They're not exact Im mirror images of each other. But as you can see on the right here, how it's how much air there is, how much negative space. So each one of these is carved from a solid chunk of wood. And I think perhaps our next slide shows that. Well, this shows, well that, yes, this slide shows those chunks and the clay modeling that is required to give you a full visual of what you were trying to accomplish. So I did this clay model, which gave me front and back uh, shaping decisions, and that's transferred to a large chunk of wood. It's cut out roughly and then attached to a board and then I'm carving away. I do the front first and then I relieve it on the back side. And let's go back one slide because I just wanted to point out quickly, uh, on the right is Grinling Gibbons, this wonderful carver of the English court that did these fantastic carvings that uh, I'm trying to capture some of the feeling of, of what he was able to accomplish. And then I also wanted to show everybody that the, this is a Dunlap, uh, again, a New Hampshire piece from the 18th century um, piece that had such emphasis on the crown. And that was a fun thing to be able to show, to relate to, to my work, not only the carving, but also that repetitive molding aspect up on top. Even though we're doing a different theme, um, there, there's a common aspect to it. So um, moving forward. I think we have some details of the, uh, of the top element of the maple leaves. Yeah, we can Do you want to go forward. Yeah, there's the two. And so the maple leaves, I actually went out and got, got small twigs of actual leaves to kind of mock up what I'm trying to do. So I did that, taped them on, and then once I decided on that, the next slide will show the clay models that I developed and to show also that there are three separate carvings that are done so I can carve the front and the back, keeping it very thin. These leaves are about a sixteenth of an inch thick. And then I was able to assemble these leaves. Uh, the next slide will show this assemblage and 
this is the aspect that Gibbons really uh, excelled in to get that lightness and that airiness. So from here, we can then hang the piece up on the, the sweep structure. And I just used a simple nail, a uh, hand wrought nail that goes through a space in the twigs uh, to do it. And you can see how easily they just kind of lay there and, and sort of lay over those struts. And those are, those are carved in pine, which is kind of interesting. So I think the, the, the finished effect is just spectacular. It's really dramatic. You have the, uh, the carved relief um, below of the, of the sugar maple leaves. And then you have this group, three groups of leaves that look like, as you said, have just fallen off a tree and are resting on the, on the top of the piece. So it gives a very lifelike sense to those, to those elements. Thank you. Um, and I think the, the last aspect we were going to talk about was just uh, the magic of the, of the finish what, when, when it all comes together. Yeah, and here again, I need, to, I need to talk about my wonderful wife, Janet, and the ex excellent work she does. She's laying on this shellac here, and you can see in her hand, she has a jar of shellac, which has virtually no color at all, and the wood is very pale, but when you combine the two, the colors just start to pop. And this is, of course, the first coat, our first sense of magic and wow as to what we're getting, um, which is always a great time. And the next slide shows the full depth of color. And she had control of this from beginning to end with all the layers of, of hand brush shellac and rubbing out with, with paper and wool and the waxing and uh, the end result is very silky. Unfortunately, not everyone will be able to touch it, will they, Andrew? <laughs> but it feels like a piece of glass, I can attest to that. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. And I think here, you know, as we were talking earlier, is just the, the drama of the way the veneer goes around the, around the piece. And you see that on both the front and the sides and makes it look almost like this block of, of golden ice. Yeah, it's a very dramatic image. And, and I guess we're looking at, oh, 300 to almost 400 pieces of veneer right there, just, just in this upper quadrant. Um, it's, it's really great, but it's so much fun to see the consistency between the panels and then also realizing that they're all different. Um, and then the, um, on the next slide, the uh, other aspect of the piece, one of the, one of the details that I know was really important to you is we talked about the development of um, the hardware near the end of the project um, was the way this whole um, aspect uh, developed and was finally executed by a fellow craftsperson. Yeah, so it was important to me to have a, uh, a New Hampshire craftsman uh, do the, the blacksmith work. And this man is Gary Collagian from Bradford. And from the get-go, I had this pattern that I wanted to do. Uh, and, and so I had it drawn. And the next slide will show the, the wooden pattern that I made. Uh, so this was a life-size wooden pattern of, of pine. And I took it to Gary and I said, Gary, I want to make this out of iron. And it's very thin, it's curved delicate and he worked very closely with me to make this this drop that will hinge up this, um, it's called a pendant pull it'll hinge up and pull out and the next slide will show a beautiful profile of that and i wanted the hand hammering and you see this wonderful little hook in the back of it up near the top and that is a stop so once after you pull out the drawer or open the door if you let go of the pull, it will drop, but that stop keeps it from banging into the, into the wood. So it was a wonderful feature he developed, and there's a lot, a tremendous amount of handwork that he put into this uh, piece of, of, of hardware. And the other important aspect of the hardware that I wanted, besides everything being so golden and polished, I wanted the hardware to represent the hardworking um, settlers of, of the state and the sort of the nature of, of the New Hampshire person. 
to me, that hand forged, no nonsense kind of wrought individual was important for me to convey in this piece. In addition to the natural beauty of, of our forests, I wanted this aspect of the humanity uh, to come through. And I think it, it certainly does in all aspects of the, of the piece. And again, it's what it's more than eight feet tall. Um, it's really quite a dramatic presence in the galleries. And I look forward to being able to share it in person uh, with, with you again and with museum visitors when we can get back into the, into the building. And I look forward to that very much. That would be yeah. wonderful. Um, do we have questions from the, uh, from the webinar audience? Um, again, if you want to put those in the, in the chat box or the Q&A box, we'll see if we can follow those. Um, and in the meantime, I had a couple questions for you, David, on things we've <coughs> talked about before that I think people would be interested in hearing about. Your um, apprenticeship with Alejandro was an important um, aspect of your development of a craftsman. Can you talk a little bit about what that experience was like working with a, a European trained master craftsman and what, uh, you know, what was instilled in addition to just uh, skills? Sure. It, I think, yeah, it, every day was, was focused on skills and the repetitive nature of that. And, um, you know, the, the repetition of, it's like learning how to play the piano. When you're learning how to dovetail, you've got to practice your scales every day in the piano. And with dovetailing or any other joinery aspect, you need to repeat those process uh, continually till it becomes second nature. Um, so that was a huge part of the day. But the other major part was we would stop and talk and he would, he would talk about the philosophy of the craftsman and and how important it is and, and the integrity that you need to have. And also, you know, it's not about fooling around, it's about getting to work. And he really emphasized that, that it's, you know, it's a commitment that you're, you're approaching. And uh, that whole, you need to have that kind of frame of mind when you're doing this and you can't, you know, la di da through the day and make something pretty, you need, because you, you need to sell it, right? You need to, be able to support yourself so you're, you can continue doing this. So there was that very uh, frank discussion about that aspect to it, but the whole philosophy of what it means to be a craftsman and then the nature and, and having your own voice in your work, even if you're doing traditional work, you have the opportunity to still have it reflect who you are, just like the people did in the 18th century with you know, say if you're working the Chippendale style, you can identify various makers by the way they did their work. Well, you can do the same thing with people today. Even if they're working in that old style, you can still say, oh, that's a Bill Thomas piece or a Tom McLaughlin piece or a David Lamb piece or anything like that because of certain elements that these craftsmen put in. So that was very important. And one last thing I wanted to mention about the apprenticeship part was uh, he always would say, there's always a way to accomplish something. So if you're designing something and it's a head scratch, you don't know quite how to do it based on tradition, just because you've been trained thoroughly in that way, there is a way to accomplish that goal when you, when you think of, you know, how you can do it. So there's always a way to accomplish this design task through craftsmanship. And but Jerry was, Austin would talk about that too. Yeah. yeah. And he invented, also invented new ways to, new techniques to make things so he could produce the shapes he wanted to, um, to make uh, in, in his pieces. Um, exactly. Got a, got a few questions. I'm going to combine a couple of them together. Right. Um, we would like to know how long it took to make the piece. And also, uh, what might we expect to see in terms of the finish changing over time in terms of um, you know, kind of color? Or how is it going to look in 15 or 20 years if we can speculate? Sure. It, well, physically, I mean, we talked about this for a, a number of years from a concept to final development. Uh, but the, the physical work on the piece, 
elapsed over 18 months. So it, it was a significant project. It was, it was very time consuming. And, you know, when you have to go out in the woods to cut trees, that really adds a lot because you're not just picking up the phone and saying, I need 3,000 feet of birch crotch veneers, get them here next week. Um, so it, it was a, a time commitment. Um, but the other aspect, the color, I expect, um, well, because it's in a situation where it's not exposed to natural daylight, that there will be some shifting of colors. It, it will be a mellowing of colors, but it will maintain this, this amber golden color without getting significantly darker or lighter. I, I don't expect any fading because I didn't add any color to it. And I don't expect, because it's, there's no ultraviolet light coming in, that it too darken significantly either. We have a, a question. Um, someone's wondering what surprised you the most throughout this whole uh, odyssey or process. So was there a, a particular thing that either turned out differently than you anticipated um, or was more challenging than you thought it would be? What, what was the most surprising aspect or uh, just working with the museum? <laughs> Well, working with the museum was great because you guys really encouraged me to, to push, push it, you know, and, and not just make a piece, but let's, let's do more, let's do more. And, and I, as a craftsman and an artist, I really appreciated that opportunity. Um, as far as surprises go, I think the whole thing was a series of surprises and they were all pleasant. There were some challenging things, um, like uh, when I was, developing the process for that front part of the freeze, that steam bent part, I had to really come up with several um, processes to be able to accomplish that because um, there were just challenges, both in the material that I needed to use and in the physical ability of bending something and keeping it exactly where I wanted it. Um, one positive part about that steaming process was I had read in my research that if I uh, added ammonia to the water that I'm boiling to make the steam, that softens the fibers a little bit to make the bending easier. Well, that was great and it worked great, but it also had a side effect where it colored the wood right through the whole thickness of the board to actually make that piece of birch darker which I thought was great because I wanted that banding to be prominent and having it a little darker helped it stand out. And one thing that's a great shot of, of the steaming apparatus. So in addition to bending, steaming and bending for the front piece, I also had to go through the process of, of the side pieces too, because even though I wasn't going to bend them, I needed to institute that same coloring process uh, to the side so it would be consistent. This is a great picture to look at real quickly because it also shows the other aspect of putting all these saw cuts in the back. This relieved the compression when you're bending it so it bent a little more easier. In the background, there's the form that I bent it on when it came out of that big tube, it's very hot, you know, it's 200 something degrees, and I'm clamping it on there. And then after it dries, then in the foreground here, you can see this green and white piece of wood, that's poplar, and that's a lamination. So that got glued to the back of the steamed piece. So that's what helped me develop a, a rigid um, piece of wood to carve. Um, but anyway, this, so that all these unknown, unseen, sort of hidden processes came out with some pretty neat things, the coloring being one of the primary discoveries. Um, and I think that, you know, that, that uh, discussion of the steam bending and the curfing is certainly something that was challenging and kind of discovered in the, in the process of the, of the piece. Mm -hmm. um, and didn't you also mention that a, a, one of those pieces of wood was from Shaker Village that had been cut decades ago? Right. That whole, all those freeze pieces came from, from some wood that I had cut up there. I actually asked Elders Bertha Lindsay if I could have permission to go out back and cut two trees. One was a big old red maple that was 
curly maple was spectacular and the other was a big black birch tree. And so this is the black birch tree that had a nice colored heartwood that I used for this thing. So it was probably close to 40 years old when I started and it was air dried. And that's what you want to use when you're steaming. You want to use air dried wood because it is easier to bend. But because it was 40 years old, it sort of had a mind of its own. So I had to, I had to work with that. Um, so yeah, it was challenging, but it, it has a good storyline attached to it. Um, so I have a couple more uh, questions related to, uh, to, to finish. Um, so uh, one person's observing that the birch leaves look unfinished, or is there a different finish on that that gives it that, that uh, glossy look that may be different from the veneers? And uh, another uh, viewer says, will you use this approach to veneering ice crystals again? Um, so uh, two, two questions there combined. Sure. Um, yes, I did the, the leaves a different, for one thing, the leaves are carved out of pine. So it's a different wood. And I didn't want them shiny because I didn't want to, primarily, I didn't want to have to handle them a lot. They were so delicate. But they do have a wash of, of shellac, the same material that's on the base of the piece, just not built up and polished. So I wanted, I did that on purpose because I wanted it to just not look so refined that it didn't look natural. So that was a purposeful approach. Um, and then and then as far as the birch goes, uh, the, the fractal aspect, this is not my first approach at that. I have done, oh, I'd say eight or nine pieces now with this fractal approach. However, this by far is the first one that's so completely veneered. Um, but I've done tabletops like this, and I do look forward to doing other significant works like this, whether it's a chest of drawers or a chest on chest or a dining table or what have you, because I think there's a lot of room for experimentation and design development. Or, yeah, I'd love to do it. Um, which reminds me, uh, people can find more information about your work and you uh, and commissions and how they might go about that through your website, davidlambfurniture.com. And I uh, encourage people to explore that because there's some great photographs of other pieces you've made, especially the collaborations with Jim Aponovich, which are uh, really wonderful uh, artworks in their, in their own, uh, own right. Um, I have one question that I think is for me, someone asks uh, where this piece will be exhibited. Um, and that brings up an interesting observation uh, for, um, you know, our thought was this could be exhibited in contemporary galleries with um, contemporary work. It could be exhibited in the American gallery with some of the historic furniture, trying to tie this tradition together. But for the video uh, filming, because of all the difficulty in working in the building and the COVID-19 practices, we wound up uh, parking it temporarily in the European gallery in the Baroque section. Um, so it appears next to uh, Tiepolo uh, and the Baroque frames on works like the Courier's Copley, as well as this beautiful Baroque um, Ormolu uh, clock. And I, I was just really surprised and impressed with how wonderful it looked there and how it fit in even as a contemporary piece um, with these Baroque elements, which certainly comes back to the, to the Gibbons carving and some of those Baroque elements. So I think there's a number of different places and ways it can be, it can be exhibited. I uh, look forward to having an opportunity to experiment and discover it in different locations and how it looks with, with different objects. So I think uh, we've been talking for an hour, and I, th I think probably we should we should wrap it up. Um, and uh, we will uh, we've recorded this, so we'll post it uh, once once we get through um, preparing it online, so people can can see it and you can share it there. Uh, and uh, look forward to seeing people um, around the piece at some point, safely distanced, um, in the future when we can reopen the museum which we hope will be sometime in, in August, but you know, safety is our main concern. So we're waiting to see how things develop um, over, the next, over the next few weeks. And I wanna thank everybody for, for tuning in and the opportunity to, to present it to everybody. Thank you. Great. 
Thank you very much, David. Thank you, Carol Fabricat, for um, putting all this together from a technology uh, point of view and driving uh, driving the car for us tonight. And thank you all for uh, for attending. We really appreciate uh, you joining us to listen and learn about this piece. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you.